lesson, you will be taking notes over figurative language and theme. Figurative language is language that's intended to create an image, association, or other effect in the mind of the listener or reader that goes beyond the literal meaning or expected meaning of the words involved. A simile is comparing two unlike things using the words like or as. An example of a simile would be a statement like, her eyes were like stars. The girl's eyes are being compared to the stars and the comparison is using the word like. Another example is, Susan is as gentle as a kitten. Susan is being compared to a kitten because they are both gentle. Notice that this comparison uses the word as. A metaphor is very similar to a simile. With a metaphor, you're comparing two unlike things without using like or as. So in a metaphor, you're saying that one thing is something else. He's a lion when he fights. Her eyes were sparkling emeralds. Notice in these statements, they're not saying it's like the other thing, they're just saying it is it. A hyperbole is the use of exaggeration as a rhetorical device or figure of speech. It emphasizes strong feelings and emotions and creates a strong impression. As a figure of speech, it is usually not meant to be taken literally. For example, if I said, this bag weighs a ton, it doesn't literally weigh a ton, I just mean it weighs a lot. Or, we waited a million years to be seated at our table. We didn't literally wait a million years, it just means that we waited a long time. Personification is giving human characteristics to things that are not human. For example, the angry floodwaters slapped the house. Floodwaters aren't people, and so they can't literally slap. It just means that the water hit up against the house, or the sun smiled down on us. The sun can't actually smile. It just means that the sun was shining brightly. When the same consonant sound is repeated at the beginning of the word, it's called alliteration. Miss Warren was worried when Wendy was waiting. That's an example of alliteration because many of the words start with the same sound. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers or rubber baby buggy bumpers. People often call these tongue twisters because they're hard to say. An onomatopoeia is the use of a word to describe or imitate a natural sound made by an object or action. These are words that sound like what they mean. For example, hiss is the sound that a snake makes, or buzz, the sound that a bee makes, or a car goes zoom. All of those words are onomatopoeias. An idiom is a group of words whose meaning isn't understood from their literal meanings. In order to understand idioms, you have to know what they mean. If I said fish out of water, you're thinking literally it seems like there's a fish that's not in the water, but that's just a phrase that people use meet about being somewhere that you don't belong. Allusion is when an author alludes to or refers to a famous person, place, or event. The gold medal winner was a Cinderella story. In this example of illusion, the author is referring to the story of Cinderella. This phrase, a Cinderella story, is an example of when somebody comes from low status or they're unexpected to achieve great things and then they do. She acts like Scrooge with her money and will not buy anything if she does not need it. This is referring to Ebenezer Scrooge. An oxymoron is a word or phrase in which the two words contradict each other. They're used in, as opposites. So for example, if I said, that's old news, old and news are opposites. If it's news, it should be current. So old news, those words work in opposite of each other. Or it's a jumbo shrimp, because jumbo means big, shrimp means small. Plastic silverware. 
silverware is supposed to be silver. So if it's plastic silverware, those words are in opposite of each other. Yesterday we talked a lot about inferring and remember with it when we're inferring we're taking our background knowledge or our schema what we already know and mixing that with evidence from the text to come to a new idea or make an inference. So why do we need to know this? Well when we read a text we infer the theme or the big idea. When the words we read cause us to feel strong emotions, we infer that the theme elicits that emotion. For example, if there's social injustice in the story we're reading, we, it makes us feel a certain way. We might feel angry or upset. To infer themes or big ideas, the reader needs to merge his or her background knowledge with evidence from the text and then figure out what is the big idea of the text. So when you're discovering the theme, it is an inference. Now, many students don't understand how to infer the theme or the big idea. They think that by retelling the plot or telling the main ideas, it's the big idea. But it's a little bit different. When we infer the theme or the big idea, it's important to understand that every story may have many themes and that a theme is not the main idea. You have to think bigger than that. When we're thinking about the theme, it's not just what is the story mostly about, but it's what is the life lesson or the idea that the story uh, the author wants you to know about what's written. We need to consider the author's purpose. When a writer writes a story or a piece of literary work, he or she has probably had a reason or a purpose for writing that in the first place. Usually the author has an idea, an issue, or a message that he wants to get across. Many times the author has more than one underlying theme or idea in a story. These big ideas are not expressed directly, they must be inferred. So the author is often not going to tell you the theme, you have to infer that. The only time that sometimes they do is like in um, folk tales or things like that, like let's say the turtle and the hare, they'll say at the end, slow and steady wins the race. That's a theme or a moral to the story, and in folk tales and fables they do often tell you. But in most things that we read, we have to infer the theme. Here are just a list of some common themes or truths, meaning these are universal themes, things that we see come up in multiple stories, like the theme of rejection or acceptance, the theme of good versus evil or friendship, freedom and justi ju justice, perseverance, meaning kind of the idea of hard work pays off. So as you look at this list, I want you to think about some of these themes that you see in stories that you've heard, books that you've read, or movies that you've seen. In order to figure out the theme of the story, we have to first understand what theme is. Now there's a big difference between theme and plot. The plot is the pattern of the events of the story, like character, setting, problems, events, solution, that plot diagram. But theme is the big idea. We have to infer themes. We do this, again, by taking our background knowledge, what we already know, what we already have in our heads, our schema, and the text clues, meaning the evidence from the text, what the text says, and we put them together to infer the theme. Sometimes we react to the theme of the story when we cry, laugh, or feel angry. And it's important to know that we don't always have to agree with the theme or the issue or the message of the author. It's just what, we, um, what the author thinks to be true. Pay attention to clues. As you're reading, you're gonna be finding those clues in the text. You have to start noticing the clues. Think about the literary elements. Where is it describing the character? Where is it describing the setting? Look at the imagery. Where are things being described? In other words, theme is illuminated or theme is discovered by looking at those literary elements. As you read, you have to infer the theme. As you infer, that's when you're taking those notes, you're noticing the evidence or the clue, you're thinking about the big idea or the theme. During reading, you have to infer themes and determine what text evidence helped you come to that conclusion. And then after reading, refer to the evidence. You may want to refer to your universal themes chart to help you with this piece. So how do we determine this theme of a selection we've read? Well, the first step is to create a list of topics from the story. So after reading The Wizard of Oz, you might think of topics such as greed, love, sacrifice, empathy, fate, and reality. 
Step two is then to select the strongest topic from the list, which one most applies to the story that you read. So in this case, we might choose reality. Then step three is to write a sentence about what the author believes about that topic. So reality, what does the author believe about reality? The author believes that when people lose sight of reality, they forget to appreciate the beauty of their everyday lives. Step four is to cross out the author believes that and then just revise your sentence so that it sounds like you're stating the theme. Here's an example theme statement for The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz reveals that when people lose sight of reality, they forget to appreciate the beauty of their everyday lives. Yeah.